everyone, this is Dr. Bob Brown I'm recording uh, Community Coronavirus Update number 43. The theme today is Nebraska's in the red zone and unfortunately we're not talking Husker football. So if you look at uh, the national rates, so Nebraska is now one of the red states, unfortunately. Our rates are still going up and uh, would classify us as dangerous number of new cases. Uh, so we're following those around us and of course it's most of uh, the, the counties in Nebraska, especially toward the eastern half of the state, but also over here too. Uh, so this is disappointing. Uh, there was a really good news conference uh, on Monday afternoon uh, by a lot of the uh, public health and uh, specialists and uh, infectious disease doctor at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, uh, basically calling out a warning shot that we're hitting the point where hospitalizations in Nebraska could be exceeding uh, supply if we don't do anything soon. These are the people who might take care of you should you get sick, and they're telling you we need to take this more seriously because we could exceed hospital capacity in Nebraska in the coming weeks. Uh, why are they saying that? Well, essentially, if you look back uh, where we started, we had our, our peak in the spring of infection rates May 8th, which resulted in our peak hospitalization rate May 27th. And so what happens is that hospitalizations follow uh, infections by two to three weeks. Well, if you look at where we are right now, we're actually far above this. We're at 260 to 270. That is reflective of the number of infections we had three weeks ago, not the number of infections we have right now. So we're going to likely go up quite a bit higher than this, and this is causing uh, some uh, very serious concern amongst uh, those who are going to have to take care of all of you if you get sick. Uh, and additionally, this appears to be an older demographic getting sick now as opposed to here or here. And so again, that'll even increase things even further. Um, and this isn't unique to Nebraska, uh, pretty much across the Midwest where uh, state after state is starting to hit hospital capacity, Wisconsin, Montana, South Dakota. Uh, it's a concern about Northeast Nebraska because the places they might refer to uh, aren't necessarily Omaha and Lincoln if you're farther Northeast, but South Dakota and Iowa could also fill. Uh, so this becomes a whole regional problem. Uh, here locally uh, this morning, the Piper Brian Health also pointed out that they're starting to ha have some capacity concerns. Uh, the other thing that people don't uh, kind of forget about it uh, is that coronavirus is sometimes a very long illness, meaning it people can be in the ICU for two, three, four weeks, and it's very, very high intensity care. So yes, we have enough ventilators and probably enough actually physical beds and ICUs, but people are forgetting and what does not show up in this dashboard is the primary limitation is staffing actually. Uh, those ventilators don't run themselves. You need physicians, nurses, and respiratory therapists to run them. And nurses, critically, they have to be there 24 seven. And so we do we have enough ICU nurses to staff all these beds? Uh, and how long can we hold, maintain this? So maybe we can handle a surge for a week or two, but for weeks or months on end, this becomes a serious problem. So the biggest concern there uh, is nursing supply, honestly. And so uh, they are raising the alarm. And so it's up to you guys to start doing a better job. So now what? Well, will it come? The hospitals can't control the system. It's a public health response, which means our politicians and leaders need to get on top of this. Um, a new article that came out last week in the Atlantic uh, talks about a different take on how contact tracing should be looked at and not, not simply the, the spread, uh, you know, I've talked about the r not, but actually the dispersion. What they're discovering is unlike influenza, it's not as a predictable rate of spread. It tends to be very susceptible to super spreading events. Uh, and uh, the Japanese were some of the first people to figure this out and probably is responsible why the Japanese have done so much better than many of the other countries. Uh, they basically what they did is they did really good contracts uh, tracing and analyzed where a spread was coming from. So rather than just focusing on the individual level, where did this person infect that level and let's isolate those people, they tracked it back to where it was coming from. They, tack they tackled it at the source. Um, and why do I say J Japan is the number one? Well, if you look at their, their, their results, they are by far the best in the world. Um, the way to judge a country, country's response is what is the overall fatality rate compared to their population. The U.S. at 64 is one of the worst countries, unfortunately, uh, as is Sweden uh, and, and uh, United Kingdom, Mexico. India, uh, this is an outlier, but that's because their infections are really new. A lot of those people haven't died yet, so I don't wouldn't go by that. But if you look at this, Japan at only 1.3 per 100,000. If we had the results of Japan, instead of having 200,000, 210,000 dead Americans, we'd only have 4,000 dead Americans. That's how much better Japan has done than us. And if you've ever been to Japan, the d urban density in Osaka and Tokyo, they are perfectly spread up for a pandemic to spread, but they did, they were able to contain this despite that. Uh, Lincoln, Nebraska on a Husker game day, that doesn't even touch Osaka on a typical Tuesday night. So their density to, to achieve these results is even more amazing. Um, so what they did is they, like this main study, they did a really good job of tracing back what types of places caused the spread, not just looking at just the individual and trying to stop transmission. They went back and said, what is the source? Let's weed out the sources. 
Uh, so in the Japanese study, uh, it was healthcare facilities, nursing homes, bars, restaurants, workplaces, gyms, all these things uh, that they went after, and that's how they controlled the epidemic. Uh, and then they put together a great communication plan. They had one advantage on us in that the Japanese already tended to wear masks. And so it's a cur uh, out of courtesy in most East Asian cultures, whenever you get a cough or runny nose, you put on a mask to, to prevent getting infecting those around you. They were doing this before coronavirus happened, and so it was pr a pretty easy lift to get them to wear masks. We still have people thinking this is a hoax, ignoring public health advice, thinking this is some civil liberty or pro political argument. This is a scientific argument. It is rock solid that masks work. On addition to that, then the Japanese put out a very clear, consistent message from the top down, avoiding these three types of spaces. Is it a closed space, a crowded space, and is there close contact? Uh, and so by avoiding these spaces, this is how they were able to get their pandemic under control. It really, this was the main focus, wear a mask and avoid these situations. And if you do that, that puts the epidemic under control. Um, and you also may have heard uh, Dr. Lawler when on the UNMC news conference, he talked about there were three C's. The other thing that people need to realize, yes, I, evidence and recommendations will change over time. That's because this is a new infection and we're learning new tips and tricks. So then initially there was a recommendation only sick people. What was not recognized back then is the degree to which asymptomatic people transmit the disease. That's why everybody needs to be wearing masks. Uh, and so this is new compared to other diseases. The other thing is there was a little too much emphasis on six feet as if it was some magic number. Uh, what we are seeing is there probably is at least some aerosol spread. So yes, six feet is good, but more is even better, especially if you're singing, yelling, or indoors. Uh, I actually would not go to a gym right now if people are not wearing masks because it's going to spread when you're breathing heavily on an exercise bike more than six feet, maybe eight, 10, 12 feet. So six feet alone is not enough. You need to have the mask and you need to watch these other things. Now, the good news is that there was uh, maybe a little too much emphasis on cleaning objects and mail and groceries and things like that. It appears that, that contact spread is not a major factor. So basically just disinfect frequently, touch services, and wash your hands, and you're going to be good. So don't overdo it on this other stuff. Spend more time thinking about over here. So questions we really need answers to. There's still some remaining questions for us. Um, where, where is it really spreading right now in Lincoln? I wish we would have some public results similar to those Japanese studies about where things are really uh, spreading. We don't have to worry about some of the areas, like healthcare facilities. Some of these things were, were before people were wearing masks. Uh, my wife and I are both physicians. My wife is seeing patients every day. We don't know a single doctor or nurse who, who contracted coronavirus from a patient. So uh, the day-to-day -day activities is not, uh, it can, you can prevent spread. All the ones we know did contact it from either a coworker or a spouse. Nursing homes, kind of the same thing. As long as we can keep the staff and everybody wearing, nurse, wearing masks, we can actually limit spread quite a bit. Workplaces, again, uh, most workplaces now require people to wear masks. Uh, travel on airplanes, this was before mask was wearing, was uh, prominent. So I think uh, now we, airplanes may be okay with people are wearing masks, air changes, and empty seats in the middle. So the remaining places are restaurants and bars, music-related events, gyms, ceremonial functions, basically think churches and weddings. This is likely where most of our spread is happening. It'd be nice to see a nice uh, uh, breakdown with percentages uh, from our health departments in Nebraska on this. Uh, one of my concerns is, is coffee shops. I actually do go into a coffee shop to order coffee, but I do not stay in the coffee shop if I look around and, and I don't see a lot of people wearing masks. Uh, I have met one person in a coffee shop where we sat there, uh, but there weren't that very many people. They were wearing masks. Uh, I would we would take the, I would pull my mask down to, to take a sip of coffee and put it right back on again. But when I most coffee shops I go to, I look around, there's not people wearing masks. So I would order your coffee and get the heck out of there for now until more people start wearing their masks and being better about things. Uh, there's other suggestions. I like Han put this out a while back ago about an eight-week plan. I don't think I haven't seen any health departments take up. This would be a really good way to monitor, measure contact tracing. Just these uh, four simple things would make a huge difference. One of our limitations, unfortunately, is test turnaround uh, to contact of less than 48 hours. Uh, we still don't have rapid test availability, unfortunately. Uh, test Nebraska had made some improvements a couple weeks ago. They're back up to three, four days again. So it's really only Physicians Lab and LabCorp. These are the labs used by a lot of independent physician offices in Bryan Health. So they'll get you a prior more rapid test than the others, unfortunately. We really needed this less than 48 hours, not up in the three to four day range. Uh, is COVID, COVID spreading in schools? This is one thing I wish we had a little better data on. Uh, the good news is we don't have any evidence of within school spread. We're not seeing that through contact tracing. However, there's still some other data I wish we would capture. Um, could it be spreading undetected? And if so, it might be the first people we would see it in as parents. So are we capturing whether on contact tracing the person infected is a school parent? Because uh, this could be an early uh, one of the warning signs that it actually is spreading in schools uh, despite not seeing it quite yet. Another thing we could do is surveillance testing. I wish we would do a little bit of this. 
Uh, other countries were doing this months ago. I talked about this in the May 28th update, number 23. So Germany and China, when they brought back uh, kids to school, they were doing surveillance testing. Unfortunately, the United States has no plan to do this. It's hard for a school to do it by itself because of legal and logistic reasons. We really need uh, either the state or local health departments to be supervising this for a lot of legal reasons. Uh, the University of Nebraska could put something together for this. Uh, we just need uh, some support. And I think this would be a good thing to, to do just to reassure ourselves that the processes we put in place are safe as we move forward. Forward. Should I get a test? So I get a quite question like this. I actually have never had a coronavirus test myself and the reason I've not tested myself is because I have not had a reason to test myself. Uh, I've avoided contact uh, high-risk settings. I've not been exposed to anybody to my knowledge at this point. I wear a mask wherever I'm around the community so I haven't had a reason to have a test yet. However, if you are a close contact uh, or you're a high-risk setting, you do need to get a test. So first, why are you getting tested? The th other thing is understanding kind of the difference between quarantine time and isolation time. So quarantine, uh, that comes from the Latin word for, uh, for 40, which is uh, back in the old days in Venice, they would make a ship sit out in the harbor for 40 days to make sure nobody had the plague. So they let them out there for 40 days and nobody got sick, then they'd let them in the, in the city. Thankfully, we don't have to wait 40 days. We only have to wait 14 days because that's the incubation time for coronavirus. Uh, average is five days, so you may turn positive here, but it may take all the way to here. Isolation is when somebody actually has coronavirus and has been confirmed. When you've been confirmed to have, uh, then it's 10 days because that's about the time uh, you would hopefully get over it and not longer be infectious. You've already passed the incubation phase, so that's why isolation is actually shorter than quarantine time. Uh, some examples, uh, let's say uh, President Trump, as some of you may know, as far as we know, his first positive test was October 1st. If that is in fact the time he became positive, that means he needs to be isolated for 10 more days, assuming he has no symptoms. So even though it's 10 days, if he's still having a cough and sick, he is still has to be isolated even longer than that. Until then, he should not be around anybody else without wearing a mask. Uh, another example would be a uh, uh, former Vice President Joe Biden, who uh, may have actually been infected by uh, or exposed by uh, President Trump during the debate September 29th and that night. Uh, although he was more than six feet away, as we know, sometimes it can spread farther, so he probably does need to isolate himself, which I hear he's doing. Uh, the other thing is, though, just because he has a negative test doesn't mean he's in the clear. He's got to wait 14 days before he is okay to be around other folks because he could turn positive at any point in the 14-day time period. Now, let's say he turns positive on October 6th. That means he still has yet another 10 days uh, because now he is potentially infectious. Here at this, that actually, of course, maybe that may stop the debate because maybe it's possible that Trump actually infected Biden. Uh, and so that's kind of how you have to think through the quarantine plus isolation. And sometimes it can be more than 14 days if you develop an infection. And then now you have to go to switch to isolation time. Uh, another question that I keep hearing is just because you have a negative test doesn't mean you can return to work after an exposure. If you were exposed this day and you get a test on day five, you're not in the clear yet. You're not okay to return to work necessarily, uh, depending on your situation, for up to 14 days because you could turn positive on day 13 or 14. So just to have a negative test here does not mean you're in the clear. Uh, some rapid testing might help us a little better, but that's a whole other story. Uh, for other things, if you're interested uh, in our day jobs, Ted and I, we do are uh, working on other uh, sources of graphs. So, of course, we have uh, the, you know, the, the county and state level graphs based on whether you use UNMC criteria, the Harvard Saffra criteria, or no criteria. We've been putting up some other things. So you can look at the health department rates by county. It's kind of hard to interpret Nebraska counties because of low population. Uh, you could go from yellow to red just by five cases. So by lumping them in public health district, it gives you a little bit better version. They're not color coded to Harvard Saffra, but you can see like, for example, Elkhorn, Elkhorn Logo, Logan value is at 37 per 100,000. Uh, we also have some other things like infant mortality. That's what we do in our day jobs and we're not working on coronavirus. And we hope we can move to that because we're getting tired of this as well. Uh, until then, of course, uh, you know, we'll, we really are waiting for that silver bullet, which is a vaccine, but, in, but we don't have it yet, but we still do have silver buckshot to stop this in, uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, basically, if we wear a mask, stay outside better than inside, keep your distance, wash your hands, and, and, and smaller gatherings in those three C's like the Japanese, we can get this controlled before we get the vaccine and save a lot of Nebraska lives. So hopefully this is all helpful to you. This is what I do in my day job. Disclaimer, of course, and of course we put these uh, videos up on healthylincoln.org and you can see the tableau graphs on healthynebraska.org. And of course the articles I referenced, they're all down in the notes section if you want to look at them.